Amen. Brothers, sisters, friends, and guests, have a seat. It is a joy to see you as usual on Sunday. And today we are launching our fall series. We're going to spend 13 weeks talking about the church. And we're going to be discussing questions like, what is the church? Why does the church matter? How do we be the church together? Before we jump into that, I wanted to reiterate a couple things uh, Alicia had shared this morning. If you are new to this church, you're still learning about the seed, who we are, and what we do. All around the room on the windowsills, you can find these little cards. Our website's on one side. There's a QR code on the other. And if you scan that, you can get our church app. You can learn about who we are. You can connect with us in any way that you feel comfortable. And we would love to do that if you're new here. And secondly, Alicia mentioned the food drive for Church on the Street. So it's a ministry here in town. The leader is a guy named Pocky, and uh, his wife is Samantha. They're going to come and hang out with us on some Sunday here soon, next week or the week after, to tell us more about Church on the Street. But this fall, in order to serve them, because what they do is they feed the homeless in our city. Every Sunday, rain or shine, they meet in downtown Wichita. The homeless can come and get fed, and they preach the gospel and spend time with them and help people begin to get back on their feet. So we found out from them one of the ways we could serve them is to give them more food in order to feed the homeless. So it's a really simple way for us as a church to serve our city and to serve them. There are just five simple items here in front of me. Pasta sauce, water, canned green beans, canned corn, and little individual chip bag sizes. You can find that list on the weekly update, as Alicia said. But for the next like four or five weeks, you can just bring anything like this on Sunday We'll put it in my office. I'll call church on the street midweek. They're going to come grab it all and take it. And we're just going to do that for four or five weeks here to serve them this fall to help them minister. So as we're talking about being the church, one of the practical ways we could do that is to serve people in our city this way. So throw in with us. Uh, buy as much or as little as you want and um, as much as the Lord leads. And we will serve them together. I'm excited to do that. So friends, the church... Why would we do a series in the church? We're going to be here for 13 weeks. That's a quarter of the year. We're going to start today. Right as we finish, you're going to see Advent candles and Christmas stuff, and we're going to be in Advent season. So we have 13 weeks on the church and then move on to Advent together. Why are we going to do that? Three reasons to do a series in the church, and they'll be up on the screen as I give these reasons to you. Number one, fighting for fullness. Number two, challenges for the church. And number three, the power of inspired metaphors. That's our roadmap today. That's the three reasons that we're going to unpack for why I think it's valuable that we as a church would spend 13 weeks on talking about what the church is and why it matters and, and how we work together as the church. So number one, fighting for fullness. Let me explain that to you because Phil did a great job of reading our focus scripture today. And I want you to see a few things in that about the church. So verse 18 of our scripture, there's a phrase here that's unique. Here's what Paul writes. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. All right, now, Paul did write this 2,000 years ago, but he was not under any persuasion that anatomically your heart has eyes, right? Right? What does eyes of your heart mean then? Well, if you think it through, it's fairly simple. With your eyes, you can take in visual reality. You open your eyes, and you can see the world around you for what it is. Now, when Paul says, I'm praying that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you may know, here's what Paul's teaching. He's saying it's possible for us to know, but to not know. There's a knowing that's intellectual, and there is a knowing that's emotional, spiritual, moving, right? Paul is saying to these new believers here in Ephesus, I am praying for you that I want you to know, know, know something. I want you to know it so deeply, your heart feels it, you're moved by it, you're changed by it, it is working in your life. What are the things that Paul wants us to know? That's pretty important. Here's what he wants us to know. He lists three things here. To know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth 
of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Paul is saying, I am praying that emotionally, spiritually, deeply, you would know you have hope. You have hope. Number two, you have an eternal inheritance that is waiting for you. No matter what happens here, no matter what you struggle with in this life, there is eternal riches waiting for you. And number three, God is immeasurably great in power, and he uses that power for your good. Paul says, I want you to know that. I want you to know that. You always have hope. There are riches waiting on you. God is powerful, and he uses it for you. I don't want you just to know that. I want you to know that. Now, Paul goes on and begins to connect this incredible blessing to the church. So now in verse 20, he says, he, being God the Father, he exercised this power. What power? Well, the power he just talked about, this exceedingly great power of God. God exercised it or used it in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Verse 21, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Paul says, this great power that God has for us, for our good, he used this power to send his son who willingly carried the cross to cover our sins. And he rose him from the dead and made him preeminent over everything. Every moment of your life, everything about you, everything in this universe, Jesus stands above it. That's how this power looks. We say, what's the power of God look like? The power of God looks like this. Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And God made him the ruler of everything. Over all in your life is the Son of God who says, I died for you and I will not leave you. That's what God's power looks like for you and for me. And then he goes on in, in verse 22 and says, And he subjected everything under his feet. And now we're going to get to the church. And appointed him as head over everything for the church. So now Paul is teaching Everything that happens in the church, everything about the church, Jesus is appointed the head of it, the leader of it, the center of it. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the center. He's preeminent. He's appointed by God over all. And then we get this amazing picture of what the church is called to be in verse 23. Which is his body? Paul says the church is, is his body. Let's just stop there for a moment. When Jesus ascended to heaven, his physical body left this realm, right? He ascended into heaven to be seated by the Father. None of us can go travel anywhere to find the physical body of Jesus. He ascended. But when he sent the Holy Spirit, local churches like this humble place called the sea, these are designed to be spaces where mysteriously and yet truly and deeply the presence of Jesus is experienced. That's amazing. And when people come into a local church, you can't touch the hand of Jesus. You can't hug Jesus. But someone can hug one of you and someone else and another person and they can get some encouragement. And hey, how's your week been going? And I've been praying for you. And as the church is the church, people experience the presence of Jesus through this. Wow. That's beautiful. That's amazing. Where his body, it says. And then Paul uses this word, fullness. The end of verse 23. The fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So the church is designed to be a place of fullness. That's why point one is, first reason to do a series in the church is Fighting for fullness. And what I mean is, this space, we should be working together, praying together, striving together with the gospel and the indwelling power of the Spirit that the fullness of Jesus is experienced here in this midst. On Sunday morning, in gospel communities, 
in midweek time around dining room tables when you're weeping and crying and suffering and someone is caring for you. In all those moments, the church is designed to be a place where the fullness of Jesus is experienced. That's what, that's what Paul is calling us to. He's calling us to that. That's number one. Why do 13 weeks on the church? Because we ought to fight for fullness. We ought to figure out if there's areas where for whatever reason the fullness of Jesus is not experienced and to say, we don't want that. Lord, we repent of that. We want to fix that. We want there to be fullness of Jesus in our midst. Number two, challenges for the church. The church has real challenges right now. I mean, it always has. But let's just talk about the challenges now. Two points. Number one, I've been reading lots of statistics and articles about church involvement. According to one study, about one in four pre-COVID church attenders decided to either quit attending church or to significantly limit their involvement. One in four to no longer attend or at least significantly limit. And there's a variety of reasons we can talk about for this, but the reality is it's there. It's there. So it's something that we as the church have to think about and ask and dive into and learn from and lean into. Another study showed that in our culture, 18 to 34-year-olds who attend church has dropped from 36 to 26%. From 36 to 26, 18 to 34 year olds. So we have to ask the question, what, number one maybe, what about the church is not compelling? we got to figure that out. Is church just like a stale service? This guy plays music, the bald guy talks, we give some money, we all kind of get some good feelings together, and then we just go off on our own lives. That gets so stale. So if churches are that, that's not going to compel anyone to want to lean in. No one. So we have to ask the question, why, why is it not compelling? What, what are we doing great that we can lean into? What are we not doing great that we can do better? We have to ask that. Another thing that it brings up is what misunderstandings did the last few years expose? And here, here's what I mean. Something I've heard a lot read more than heard, but also heard. People saying in the last few years, boy, churches are messed up. There's these Christians that claim to follow God and they don't do right. And there's two answers to that that are both right. Number one is, yeah. I mean, you read the Bible, you read the Old Testament, the people of God spend most of their time not listening to God because God's the hero of the story, not his people. And within the people of God is always the true people of God. There's people that identify as the people of God. That doesn't mean anything. Someone puts a label on their chest, hi, I'm a Christian. Does it make them a Christian? Are they repenting? Do they believe in Jesus? Do they love the Lord of glory? Is there real evidence in their life of fruit of the Spirit? That's what makes someone a believer, that they're really in Christ. So there's that gap. But here's the other thing. When you look at Jesus' ministry did you notice who he always most attracts? Messed up people. You know? I mean, he attracts the tax collectors and the emotionally broken people and the abused people and the relationally divided people. And like just on and on, these people feel so, they're, they're drawn to Jesus. And not because it's just a space where they're never challenged. I mean, you read the Gospels and Jesus has some hard stuff to say, but he loves them. And the point being is this, the idea that churches should be full of people that are like all more put together than what you find in the culture, I don't even think that's a reasonable argument. I just think it's reasonable. Like, I think there's actually a good argument. You might find more messed up people in the church because they feel their brokenness and they're looking for hope. So should we be growing and repenting and changing? Of course. But to say that the church is a space where the most well put together people end up going and then the culture is just left with broken people, I don't see that in the Gospels. So I don't think we're going to see it in the local church. But that's just stuff for us to wrestle with. 
about how to like speak into the culture and love people and, and think about how to be the church. Second thing to talk about about challenges for the church is this phenomenon called church hurt. And all the studies show that this is way, way up. In fact, one large study polled a whole bunch of people who used to attend a church but no longer do. A little over a third of the respondents said they no longer attend church because they were hurt and they lost faith in God, the church, or Christians in general. What do we say in light of this? There's several things we should say. I'm going to say a couple of things. First, I do want to say something that's in fairness to churches. Something in fairness to churches. And here's what I mean. There's a lot of reasons why the church can be very hard and uncomfortable. And not all those reasons are bad. So for example, I am pretty sure that if 2,000 years ago, a study had been done on everyone who walked away from Jesus, and there were a lot. There were far more people that walked away from Jesus than stayed with him. That's just clear in the God. It's just historical reality. If a study would have been done on that, I'm sure many people have said, I was hurt by Jesus. I was hurt by Jesus. But they weren't really hurt by Jesus. What we would say is, a better way to name that would be, Jesus said something about his identity or something about their sin or something about who God is or the way God works or what God does or doesn't accept as acceptable worship. That Jesus said something like that. This is who I am. This is who you are. This is who God is. And people listened and they said, that offends me. That offends me and I am out. And what we would say is, that person wasn't hurt. The reality is, that person was exposed by Jesus. And we have all been there. If you're a Christian, or you're close to being a Christian, or you've spent time in church... There's always moments where the Lord brings us to like a fork in the road and something about us is exposed and we have a decision to make. Do I lean in and get crucified with Jesus or do I run? And some of us have run for seasons and come back. I have. I have. But... What Christianity looks like is we're coming to this fork in the road and we're leaning into Jesus, crucifying our flesh, drawing us to him. Please hear me. I've got more to say about church hurt. I'm not saying church hurt doesn't exist. It exists in spades. I'm saying not everything labeled church hurt is really that, right? Sometimes people feel hurt by the church. But the depth of the story is God brought me to a crossroad and I was exposed. And I just didn't want to sit in that anymore. And that's why people walked away from Jesus. And that's why people still sometimes walk away from church today. Now, on the exact same token, friends, church hurt is absolutely real. It is absolutely real. No pastor is Jesus. And some pastors don't look much anything like Jesus. And no church is perfect. So we have to ask the question, how can we as Christians talk about the church, describe the church, or be the church in a way that would inspire someone with church hurt to reconsider? Because that would be missional. How do we help someone who feels church hurt to reconsider and say, lean in, give this another try. See what God has to say. So that's also why we're going to be here. Second reason for doing this series, 13 Weeks in the Church, is to address some of the real challenges the church faces in our culture. And now number three, and this is getting into introducing our sermon series, is the power of inspired metaphors. I think sometimes the church gets boring because we don't let the New Testament tell us what the church is. And we just decide what it is. And how we decide is lame compared to what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament vision of the church 
It is rich. It's amazing. It's life-altering to be the church. And so we're going to spend the next 12 weeks. Today's the intro. And then we're going to look at four metaphors. And we're going to look at three aspects of each of those metaphors over 12 weeks. And I want to introduce you to all of them right now. So number one, the first metaphor we'll spend time in is home. The church is a home. The Bible calls it the household of God. And that means in the context of that metaphor, we are brothers and sisters. Paul says in 1 Timothy, as he's teaching Timothy how to lead the church, how to build cult in the church, he says, don't rebuke an older man, but speak to him as a father. And honor older women as your mothers. And you look at women your age or younger with all purity as sisters and other men as brothers. The church is designed to be a family dynamic. So the three aspects we'll look at is number one, belonging. The church is a place to belong. But you don't ever, you're never born into belonging in the church. As Jesus teaches in John chapter three, we're all born once, you must be reborn. You must experience spiritual rebirth. And then you're adopted into the household of God. There is no such thing as a Christian other than Jesus Christ. No one is born in the household of God. We are all spiritual orphans that are adopted in. All of us. Adopted brothers and sisters. And we belong because of that reason. But, number two, you don't just belong, you become. So in a healthy household, there's a family culture. And here's what a healthy family culture says. You belong here. And I'm making you become something. We're going to grow you. We're going to disciple you, train you, correct you. In a healthy household, kids belong and kids become. There is no such thing as belonging without becoming in the church. At the same time, you don't become in order to belong. That would be the last 13 weeks on Galatians. All of Galatians was about that, right? The false teacher saying, you better become something Gentiles before you can belong. No, through faith in Jesus Christ, you're adopted and you belong. And now it's time to become who God has made you to be, right? Third aspect is authority. There is no such thing as a healthy household without good parents. It does not exist. It just doesn't. There's no exceptions There's no interesting, sophisticated way to talk about how a house is great without good parents. It's not. A house is not great without good parents, period. Because parents protect a culture of belonging and a culture of becoming. Parents, the lead disciplers in their home. And for a local church to be healthy, we must follow biblical teaching on local church authority. Paul says, here's how you lead local churches. And he says, here's how you don't lead local churches. Because... That's how the house of God grows, to belong and become. We'll spend three weeks on that metaphor. Number two, body. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ and uses this metaphor of parts of a body that are all connected. We are all parts of one whole. And the first focus that we'll look at is function. We're designed to function together with gifts the Holy Spirit has given us. And the Bible gives a broad range of gifts. Some of those gifts are deeply spiritual, like teaching and hospitality and counseling. And some of those gifts are just very practical, like praying for a person and having a welcoming presence and things like that. And so we're going to look at how as the church we're designed to function together. But we don't just function together. We function in relationship with mutual care. Because when one part of your body hurts, the rest of your body feels it. And when one part of your body feels great, the rest of your body celebrates that because you don't hurt anymore. And so there's this relational aspect to being the church that we're connected as one body. But not just that, we are equipping one another. We're strengthening and healing each other. By the indwelling presence of the Spirit, our relationship 
equips each other to grow and to follow God and to care for others. That's what the church does. Number three, third metaphor is the temple. New Testament says that the church is like a temple. That is an old word. Usually you hear the word temple, you think of like maybe Knights Templar or something like the, the, maybe the newest you think of is 1600, like a temple. What is a temple? A temple means a place where heaven meets earth. The ancients thought about temples as these locations where you can go where the divine is brought into the world of the ordinary. And that's what the church is. The church is a space where the presence of God dwells with us. That's the first thing we'll look at is presence. God, through his Holy Spirit, dwells with his church and lives within us. But because God dwells with us, we're called to holiness. We're set apart. We don't walk in lockstep with the culture. Why? Because the God of all creation lives with us. And as Paul would say, we're citizens of a different world. When you're reborn, your passport is no longer here. It's in heaven. And so we're set apart. To follow God. And thirdly, we're priests. The Bible says, as the temple of God, we are all priests, which means all of us, to one degree or another, are called by God to take the hands of our friends and family and the hand of God and bring them together and to connect people with the Lord. Finally, number four, bride. This is the most touchy feely and maybe uncomfortable metaphor for modern people. Jesus is our covenant lover. Covenant is a word that means unbreakable commitment. So first, passion. The church is to be a place where we are in love with God. So let me give you a bit of a story from my own Christian conversion. I started really reading the Bible and, and following Jesus around freshman and high schoolish. Met some friends in the drum line, because I'm a drummer, and they all went to these youth groups, and so I went to their youth groups and got to know them um, and started following Jesus. And at that point, Christian worship music, all the songs were like, God is your girlfriend. All of them. They all were. Like, it was just a season where, like, that's how it was, you know, it was in the secret, in the quiet place. You know, it was like all this, like, stuff about, like, intimacy and closeness and, like, you know, stroking God's hair or something. Um, <laughs> And of course, like some of it, I look back now and I'm like, that's kind of wonky, you know, like you sort of lose the transcendence of God. It, you know, at the same time, though, I thank God for that season because I'm like, we're in a season right now where it's just not that normal to think of like God is my first lover. God's the lover of my soul. God loves me more than my spouse does. God, God has this deep intimacy he feels toward me. That's healthy. That's biblical. All the songs don't need to be about that, but some of them should be. So passion, we're called to be in love with God. Second, jealousy. Now you're probably hearing that word saying, I don't think we want to talk about being more sinful, Ryan, but this is a good jealousy. All throughout the Bible, there's a healthy jealousy. Paul talks about it a lot in the Corinthian letters. And here's what it looks like. If God has done work in your life, any kind of work, Imagine you have a friend or a family member who's struggling and they're looking for help in dead ends and you know it. They're looking for help in bad friendships, in addictions, in career, something like that. If the Holy Spirit's in your life and you love those people, there is a longing you feel that they would experience Jesus. I want you to find the Lord. And Paul calls that a holy jealousy that there is a longing to see people around you healthy and plugged into Jesus. And that's part of what it means to live in this bride metaphor. That we would have a longing for one another to put Jesus at the center and to not let him be edged out by anything else. And then thirdly, intimacy. Rich relationship with the Lord. So that's the 12 weeks. We're going to go much deeper into all these aspects and so now to finish the sermon here before we move to communion and worship, I've got three statements I've kind of put together that aim to weave all these metaphors together. Because what I'm just wanting to inspire us to sense 
What would this do to the experience of the seed church? Our experience and new people who come, if we could aim to live in all four of these metaphors, to live in these, to hold these together, and to view the church like this. So this first statement's a little bit longer, but here's statement number one. We are brothers and sisters who have been adopted by God into his household with his house rules under his leadership. And we all use our Holy Spirit-empowered abilities and resources to care for, heal, and equip each other because God dwells among us and he is holy and he has set us apart to be priests who connect others with him while we passionately wait for Jesus, who is our first love, to return and take us home. And until then, we pursue daily intimacy and rich relationship with God and jealously long to see everyone we know and love devoted to him. That'd be those four metaphors in one. This next one's much shorter. We are a home for adopted family, a body of mutual care and training, a temple for the majestic holiness of God, and a bride who is homesick for her first love. And finally, the third statement, and this one kind of describes what the church ought to kind of feel like or the culture of a church. The church should have a family dynamic. The church should be diligent and productive. The church should carry the holy presence of God. And the church should have passionate love for Jesus. These are all ways of holding these metaphors of the church together. And I think if you, maybe just for a moment as I'm talking, try to hear what I'm saying and think at the same time about people who have moved you closer to Jesus, a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a counselor, a pastor, a sibling, a spouse. Think about moments when you, through trials or suffering or difficulty or victories, whatever it may be, got moved closer to Jesus. I bet you the reason why that happened is because you experienced that person as a patchwork of these metaphors. This person like sees me as a, almost like a brother or sister, care about me. And this person's got like these, they're functioning for me. There's like these gifts, like these ways they're serving me, teaching me, giving me hospitality, helping me. And this person has something about them that's not just like the rest of the culture. There's something different about them. And man, this person talks a lot about Jesus. Like they really love Jesus and love the church and I think standing in these metaphors together, all four of them, is key to us being the church. And if we start chopping some of them out, you lose it. You lose it. So we're going to talk for 13 weeks total on how to do this. I have three reasons, friends, why I wanted to do this, and I'm really excited to be in this series with you. So would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you in humility and with teachable spirits. Lord, we plead with you that during this fall, as we are in this series, that you would help us set down our preconceived notions of what the church is. God, would you help us not just to take cues from the culture? Lord, that the church is not like a YMCA. It's not a consumer-centric space to get a spiritual high and just exit. Lord, it's not a place for image of wherever the biggest building or nicest looking stuff is. Lord, there's so many things our culture implicitly says about the church that are just radically false. God, make us teachable to learn from your word what the church is. And God, would you teach us here at the Seed Church to be home, body, temple, bride. Lord, because we want to glorify you and make much of you, and we want to love people around us, Lord. Would you help us to do that? 
Would you grace us, Lord, with your presence and your spirit and empower us to be your church? Lord, we praise you for Jesus and his death on the cross. Lord, that he is our covenant lover and that in the word he says without any ifs, ands, or buts, I will never leave you or forsake you. God, let those resonate with us as your people. As Paul taught us, Lord, let the eyes of our heart be enlightened that we would know the hope, the inheritance, and the power that is for us here in your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.